machine learning and stuff like that. <laughs> so as we all know, if we're here, or for those who don't, recent, oh, no. <laughs> so as we all know now, as of the last five, 10 years, we've shown that AI systems are very fragile to adversarial attacks. And consequently, we need new ways to defend these systems. But to begin with, we first need to have a way to structure a reason about these systems. And so the first objective for us was to find ways to adapt to the differences between traditional software and AI software that would still be able to conduct structured risk assessment. This developed into the second aspect, which was a structured threat analysis of our specific system application, like Katya mentioned in the beginning. This is uh, chatbots and connected autonomous vehicles. And finally, using this structured threat assessment, we had to develop novel defenses. So our A, I'm then going to be presenting a little bit on each of these. Of course, none of these are completely finished, or we're still in year one. But I'll be trying to address how we, as the security uh, side of the project, have attempted to address each of these aspects. So this is a big picture, my own interpretation of what this means, how to meet these objectives. Of course, here on the top left, we can see that we can start from a security case, a structured way to reason about the system, which will then lead us to understand what the threats are, be able to make assessments for the likelihood of attack taking place, and the effectiveness of our own defenses. This can then lead into two main aspects. First of all, the aim of the project overall is to connect all of this into a tool so that here you can see that ideally we'd like to use this threat assessments to connect to the verification properties. Now you'll hear a lot more about this later on so I won't spend too much time on it and the other array will discuss how we plan to use the tool. On the other side of things we want to have some sort of runtime mode which might take the form of an intrusion detection system, an explanation of what is going on in the system, because as the system is autonomous, has connectivity, et cetera, we need to be able to identify that. And finally, as an extra thing we wanted to investigate here, we wanted to have an automated response system. And what this means is that when you have an automated system and an attachment system, we need to, not only does it need to operate autonomously, it needs to, it needs to be able to respond to attacks autonomously. So we've been working on some strategies to be able to do this, which I will touch on later on. And of course, this is influenced by all the different aspects. There are different constraints of things we can do and can't do, which is a connection to the law and regulation side of things. And of course, then we also have some connections to the road infrastructure heuristics that some work on the past node is doing, as well as on the other side of the world. So before, however, we began our efforts, we wanted to have a way of testing this. We wanted to, to evaluate our efforts and test our security tools. So of course, what we did is we built a car. Uh, this project, uh, this involved building a one-tenth the size autonomous car. It is equipped with full working sensors to mimic a real-world vehicle. Uh, however, it is fully uh, customizable with uh, easily programmable modular design that allows us to test different setups quickly in a lab environment in order to get more accurate results than, uh, and be able to test our solution. Now, for the people who are a bit more interested about some more detail, our system specifically is equipped with three sensors, which is LiDAR, uh, smart cameras, as well as some um, speed controllers that allow to replicate automatic braking system, etc. Uh, the computing module is an NVIDIA Jetson developer kit and X, which allows us to do all the image processing on board, as well as the running the software on it. We're able to replicate all the aspects of perception, planning, and control through ROS, which is a robot operating system. It's very cleverly way to design a master slave model, where there's a central node controlling all the different components, and you can easily asynchronously connect all the things. And finally, we're able to test all our algorithms for safe autonomy, secure autonomy, codec autonomy, all on the device itself and using a realistic test environment. This is done in collaboration with the robotorium at Eric Watt who has very kindly given us some labs to test our car in. We're almost finished building it. We're running into some like, difficulty with components, but hopefully this time around next year, we'll be able to showcase our um, car and our experiment. 
Now, some of knowledge for experiments, this is in part connected to the work on NLP. So, shame that we aren't here, but I'm trying to present it as best I understand it, and hopefully, we'll be able to have some discussion with them, etc. Uh, interesting enough, when you look at the packs on sensors, they're almost never on the sensors themselves. They're on the decision making, on the machine learning making the mistakes. Actually, the sensors are a point of that we can use as a way to defend the system. The sensors are seeing something that's being interpreted, and interpretation is the thing that's breaking. So, together with the NLP people, we have been discussing a way to query the sensors to have a conversational style uh, understanding of what's going on in the system that we hypothesize could be a very easy way to stop this attack. An example of this is let's say there's an attack on a stop sign. The stop sign is red, you put a sticker on it, and we've shown plenty of examples of a car now identifying it as a speed up sign. But why simple query if we ask the car what color is the sign and the car responds red, since everybody who studied the road work, the road traffic laws, et cetera, knows that red signs are never going to be speed signs, we can automatically eliminate this attack simply by adding heuristics and context. This is quite an exciting way of looking at this, and very little work has been done in this area, if none, to combine this NLP area and security way of protecting a car. And we're looking forward to experimenting with this. Like the hope of ISEC is to try to connect with this and work. Uh, on top of this, we hope to run various blue team uh, red team analysis on it and get a real nice sense of the experiments and the results from this test bed, which we'll not be able to do on more traditional simulation based means. Now that we discussed the, uh, the test that we're going to be used, we first go on to the first point of the ISIC objectives, which are the structure reasoning about the attack. Now, we quickly identify that as systems such as autonomous cars, we don't only consider, must not, cannot really only consider security or safety as individual separate things, because as you might expect, they are inherently one, uh, not often the other, and often connected and interdependent when you have attacks coming from the sensors, from the connectivity. However, we still may be able to the car cooperate safely. So we need to have a way to reason about these two things and put them together in order to come with a structured threat analysis. This was interesting because you think that it's something done quite often, et cetera, but it's actually generally less explored area than I would have originally thought are the safety assessments, security assessments are traditionally done by different people at different stages. In the traditional systems, that might be just a way. It might be okay to do that. However, in autonomous systems such as these, it is inherently, uh, inherently needed to actually have them together. So we were looking at uh, ways to do this, and we stumbled upon both eye diagrams, which are an excellent visual representation of how to look at cause and effects and easily reason about defensive and attacks as well as faults and fault tolerances. So if we look at a simple bow tie diagram, we can actually see it as a simple causality sequence. So in an essence, we can look at a cause, which might be cause of a event. Um, we can add defenses and barriers for prevention. So we can actually put a defense mechanism to a threat, a cause. Then we have a central risk event, which, are, which represents what we're actually analyzing. And on the right side, you, we can actually reason about the outcome of this event and put recovery measures. This allows us to intuitively and quite in a nice manner see the full chain of effects of an event. This is might be familiar to some of the security people who have looked at the factories. They might have looked a lot at the left hand side of things, while we often see safety cases on the right hand side. This is a nice way to combine the two approaches. Uh, another interesting property that was actually very interesting that allowed us is the emergent point of these. Of course, multiple causes can lead to the same event and multiple outcomes. So the ability to quickly merge different sequences together to uh, combine different structure ass uh, assessments was very, uh, was very nice uh, thing for the project. And we see this as a very powerful tool to be able to actually work with system of systems of the car, something that is essential to be able to have a structured full assessment. So we want to, for example, create a different analysis of the braking system and one of the sensors, and then we can easily merge them together an overall assessment, but we can do so modularly without having to worry. And we found that we can actually then have some very structured analysis, even some simple Bayesian 
statistics. We can calculate the likelihood of events of different causes and different defenses. This allows us to quickly swap out different defenses, different scenarios, and actually analyze the different impacts of this in a very modular way without actually, uh, without actually to redo the assessment, which we found to be very useful. Uh, so this would be able to calculate the probability of event taking place given certain events and certain defenses. And of course, you have to calculate, you initially can calculate the probabilities from the statistics of what is the likelihood of a car crash, et cetera, but then you can update that for your own system given your own intuition, and this can scale quite well. Uh, likewise, we can also calculate the risk. Now, uh, there are several different ways to calculate risks and calculate uh, severity of a thing. However, they often are a combination of a factor of probability of an event taking place and the severity. So if you combine this, we can get, we can combine the probability analysis on the left-hand side, the severity on the right-hand side, and calculate the risk of an event taking place. Once again, this can all be merged with the different things. And when we combine the different probabilities with different merge assessments, we can actually see the overall risk of the system and quite we develop some semantics to be able to do that quite easily in a structured manner. And we're in the process of discussing this with some safety people to see if the extra security stuff is makes an impact. So talking about the safety and security aspect, let's actually have another look at this. So we found that actually when we're looking at the literature of safety and security, there were some key differences on how uh, the likelihood of an event were calculated. Now, when we deal with safety, we often calculate likelihood as a probability of an event taking place given enough time, or a fault taking place enough time. So in car world, we have a lot of discussion around the 10,000 mile problem. What is the chance of this going wrong after 10,000 miles? On the security side of things, actually, we look at things slightly different. We don't calculate the likelihood of an attack happening over time. We assume the attack is happening or the attack has currently going on. We calculate it as a likelihood of success. Uh, and then the defense mechanisms here might have a chance of detecting the attack, etc. This subtle change in the way uh, these are calculated actually has a huge difference on the results of the analysis. Um, and we found that actually having, there were from literature and analyzing the different ways people have mixed this, we identified the following four relationships. So the first relationship is conditional dependency. So when the security and the safety of the system depend on each other. For example, I have an idea stopping an attacker or trying to detect some sort of attack on the system, and the safety of the system can only be guaranteed if that has a security measure in place. Then there is mutual reinforcement when there is two separate safety and security measures. However, they help each other achieve over decreased over likelihood of a negative event, and likewise can therefore decrease the severity. There's also antagonistic, when, which is when a security measure or a safety measure actually has a negative impact on the safety or security of the system likewise. And this actually was quite interesting to explore because we actually saw sometimes when people put security in actually a thing, it made the system less safe, even though the attacks were less likely now, the faults were more likely, which is actually something that's quite interesting to explore when you define very, very large systems and then merging all the things together and exploring these relationships, they can actually see some very interesting stuff. And finally, the most popular way of looking at it is independent, when people just assume that nothing happens between systems. Uh, however, to highlight this a little bit better, I came up with a very quick scenario. This is obviously based on fake data, but I just wanted to show the true impact of even just changing these relationships a little bit. So let's say we have uh, an autonomous car who's driving on the road and it's speeding down the road and it's gonna, there is a road accident on the road and a little dog chasing the ball. Uh, the car is speeding, it's also currently under attack where an attacker has access to the Bluetooth channel and has now sent fake messages to the sensor so that it can no longer detect this alone. These are the two causes, the outcomes, and can we calculate the likelihood of the crash outcome given certain defenses? Actually, we found that actually by inputting our numbers in the formula and just changing the whether the relationship was independent, antagonistic, neutral, or conditional, we can see the severity has changed massively. So we can see here that actually when the initial depend, uh, mutual enforcement dependent, the severity is very, very low. And that's because the safety measure that we put in place, the defenses here, defense one, 
is actually help and defense two and three here are actually helping the security and safety of the system. So we can see the severity going quite low. Conversely, we can see actually when it's antagonistic, the severity goes, goes up even more so than when there is an independent thing. Now, this is a, a little scenario with just very simple data. However, we can see that even with just this number, so this three causes, three defenses, and one outcome, we see huge differences. And actually, we're actually looking for a lot more realistic assessment where, for example, we combine the braking system with the sensor data with the control. So if anybody has real data on those scenarios, by all means, hit me up anytime during this conference because we're hoping to get some more precise assessment and see this methodology working on a more realistic scenario. So now that we actually discussed the safety uh, security assessments, which was the first objective that leading to the second assessment, we wanted to look a little bit more on the attacks that influence the connected autonomous vehicles. Now, uh, the attacks on autonomous vehicles have two main elements. We've broken down uh, everything dealing with the connectivity, which is the usual stuff you might expect in a traditional network. We're looking at a middle attack, we're looking at the protocol, DOS attacks, trying to steal identity, taking over the sensor, data injections, and all the protocol based attacks, which are mainly around Bluetooth the CAN bus, and now these days 4G and 5G connectivity. These might be very familiar to the security people amongst you. These are very typical networks. Of course, we have some extra layers of difficulties because we have now interconnected systems with road, cars, vehicles, etc. The protocols are different, but the attacks remain similar. On the other hand, on the other side, we have the autonomy elements. These actually are characterized quite easily into two main things, which is atmospheric perturbations, which is the usual kind of given stuff, which everybody might be familiar with. For those who aren't, it's effectively changing an image slightly or a signal or some, an input to our classification slightly in order to make it go for a different classification result. These are very common in the, autonomy, in the car industry. We've seen tons, stickers on cars, sign stickers on roads, little lights flashing into the cameras, and a lot of work has been done on this. And on the other side, we have anything that injects fake data, spoofs data, poisons the data into the vehicle itself. This is normally taking advantage of the fact that CAN bus is actually a huge bus where protocol messages can just pass on it, and there is no security or verification of work. Likewise, in the defenses, we saw that whilst there is an enormous amount of literature on the connectivity side, purely because, at least from our point of view, is that there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of similarity between what we do with the traditional uh, infrastructure system. Again, the cars, we have global security, we have people doing that, we have communication, cryptography, access control, intrusion detection systems, and there's a lot of people doing this. Well, so other side, solutions for the autonomy side of things are looking a lot more sparse. We have some training based techniques to improve the robustness. We have some ways to have like trap doors inside the machine learning in order to detect an attack taking place, but there is not as much re research in this area. And so we actually kind of justified our reasoning for sticking to the autonomy side of the things, which we think is the more new, more interesting, more difficult thing. Now, of course, when you're dealing with uh, securing a system and testing a system, the first thing you want to do is testing. Now, if we look at traditional testing of systems, we have some very, very, very good standards that give us 70 tests that you have to do systematically to test a vehicle, to get a certification. Great companies such as Myra provide this ability to do this. They test the vehicle at the end of the certification if you pass these tests. And this can, this has strict rules so people can know this is a vehicle they were supposed to do, et cetera. This is, however, for traditional vehicles that are not, don't have the added element of connectivity, we don't have the added level of autonomy. And when you add these two things, this test, we, these tests no longer can capture all these other safety structures, all the assessments we just conducted using things. And when we're looking at actual adversarial testing of these systems, unfortunately, literature is quite sparse. There has been some work, but it's not completely empty. There's a lot of work, mainly focused on the connectivity. There are some four test sites in the UK for autonomous vehicles, one. Uh, <laughs> Well, mostly focusing, however, on the connectivity, so that's all the capabilities, et cetera. But there is no regulations, no certifications yet. And it's actually a very active area of research. How do we certify that a car is safe and secure given the autonomy and connectivity element? And that's something that we're we'll very happy to discuss as we go through. 
So one of the ways we wanted to look at this is, well, the difficulty here is that what do you test? Do you test the decoder they drive? Do you test the decision-making, the sensors, et cetera? Well, actually the decision-making is often a black box. We can't really test that. It's depending on the software, et cetera. So what we wanted to instead look at is, can we use explanations from the system to allow us to understand what's going on and test that? Can we use the system explanations to give context to, is there an attack going on? Why did you make this mystification? Why is the decision making wrong? And use these explanations to fine tune, fix our errors, as well as justify decision making. This can be used for a court of law. You can say, this is what error was made, it was made wrong, it could be quite good. But likewise, for security, it gives us a huge insight on decision making so we can actually defend it a lot better. And from the point of view of, of training, using the explanation, we can fix the issues and have something to easily test without infringing any issues with. Et cetera. And what you see here is a diagram of maybe a very high level diagram of what you would traditionally see in a sensing tool in a car. You have data from sensors, you have some processing where it does classification, this is a street sign, this is a kid, this is a dog. And then some control procedures says, given this, what do I do? I keep going straight or going left. And these software procedures are done by a machine learning algorithm. However, we don't know why it's made. And that's inherently where the errors lie. So with this overbranching explanation, we can actually inform it. So our basis for the defenses and for the adding adversarial testing is creating this explanation. So these explanations can inform the decision making, but can also find anomalies. So if we have an explanation, this is the road, this is what it's supposed to look like, this is the third sign, we can actually understand, oh, this is an attack, but I can actually see it's an attack because there's no way a stop can work there. But we can also actually use this, as I said earlier, to inform, to help with reliability, to explain decision making, to test the system. And finally, something that was quite interesting for us that we want to look at more and more is to inform our response. If we know why the decision is made, what the context is, we can use it to automatically respond to a threat or a fault and add resilience to it. Um, of course, this is, at the moment, we're looking at it from a very theoretical point of view. One of the things I'm hoping to discuss with you all is all for scenarios and more concrete examples for this that would be really helpful for the so I was saying, uh, heads up that you're at the end of your time slot, so I want to start, yeah. perfect. So uh, the final thing we want to explore as a novel thing is if the system is autonomous, why is it the attack is going on? These vehicles are supposed to run around the road without any human supervision. So therefore, when something goes wrong, they need to be able to recover. Now, uh, an intrusion prevention system is traditionally a response to an attack that automatically reacts to a thing, it might be passive, which has changed some policy, or active, which is automatic, actually change something in the system. However, making the right response is very difficult. Uh, as a quick diagram, we see this, given an explanation, the state of the system, the current anomaly, and heuristic constraints from the road, regulations, etc. We can automatically use reinforcement learning to learn the optimal policy. Uh, if I had more time, I'd go into more details, but actually what uh, reinforcement learning allows is to find the optimal response given a specific reward function. Now, the very interesting thing here is what is a good reward function? So the moment we use for safety stuff like near missing, stuff like zero accident, stuff like that. But actually what we really want to look is have a good definition. What is a good operation of the vehicle? These are the things that we're kind of trying to answer is, if we have a response, if we can actually find the optimal response, what is the optimal behavior? And this is hopefully going to be calculated by David in the discussion because it's such a very interesting area that it's not all that people just assume that not crashing is the optimal behavior, but actually you might have speed, optimization of battery, consumption of resources, et cetera, that are also really interesting for the current system. So to conclude, uh, Structure reasoning essential to the system. We need to be able to reason about the attacks on these traditional black boxes. Sensors, we can use to explain this explanation and help reason about the system. The autonomous systems uh, need resilience and automated recovery. If they're autonomous, we need to be able to react autonomously to attacks and threats. And explain why I can improve all applications. Uh, I'm going to finish today with also a call for action. We need more realistic scenarios for systems of systems, sensors. Uh, braking system, decision control from real data in the car. So if anybody can provide that, be really interesting to discuss. Uh, data is always needed. And yeah, I'd like to discuss what behavior do we reward to optimize vehicles, not only in terms of reactive decision making, but also how to react to threats. And then to develop new adversarial testing for autonomy. I believe the explanation side of things is very interesting for testing it, but 
any other suggestions are more than welcome. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. We have a question from the discussion session. So it's Lorenzo Stockman. 